Peace be to you, the reader. Let us arise, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with your spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Let us be attentive. The Lord spoke this parable. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at that time for the banquet he sent a servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for all is now ready. But one by one they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I pray you, have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. I pray you, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And so the servant came and reported this to his master. Then the householder, in anger, said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. For many are called, but few who are chosen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Many are called, but few are chosen. Think about that. Many are called, but few are chosen. And there was there was the householder and he called for a banquet. And what he did was he invited the people to his banquet, but they were all preoccupied with other things. Some bought oxen, some bought a field. One guy just got married. And what he said was, was I'm too busy, I'm too occupied with these other things to come to your banquet. Pray, I have pray, I beg you, have me excused. Now we know when we hear a parable that there's always a deeper meaning to the story. The deeper meaning sometimes is hid for those who don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. Why? Because it's something that is meant to strike the moral center of our, of our being, who we are. It's not a proposition. It's not an idea to be to be debated, it's a truth. And we either look at the truth and accept it, or we reject it. In other words, it's not up for debate. It just is. So those who don't want to see the truth will not hear the inner meaning. They just won't, because their hearts are not open to it. But if indeed we see, if indeed we hear, then we accept the truth as truth, and what we do is we get, begin the process of self-evaluation to compare our lives to what the truth should be, and we either embrace it more fully, or we make course corrections, or we do what is ever, ever necessary to conform ourselves to it. 
And the truth of this parable is this, is that, that God is really the householder. And God is really the one that calls us to his banquet. Now understand what this means, especially in, in scriptural terms. When you're invited to someone's home and they offer their table to you, they are bringing you into fellowship with them. It's not like going to McDonald's or Burger King and just getting something quick to eat. It's not like that. You are being invited in by the person because he's interested in knowing you and he wants you to know him. It's communion. It's a, it's a sacrifice and an offering of the person themselves to you as a gracious gift. He's inviting you in. He loves you. All that is implied. But the people were occupied with what? They were occupied with other things, the things of the world. And so they asked to be excused, and they didn't go to the banquet. Now, what did the householder do? He got angry. That's what the scripture says. He got angry. And he told his, his serv servants in so many words, if they don't want to accept my hospitality, if they don't want to accept what I have to offer them, then go out and get those who have not been invited, the blame, the blind, the maimed, those who have maladies, the infirm, bring them in because I will have supper with them. I will commune with them. I will bring them into my home and I will elevate them and I will welcome them and I will have fellowship with them. Now one of the meanings of the parable is this, and it's a hard saying, but it was really, really on one level a rejection of Israel. It was. They would not receive the Messiah. If they will not receive the Messiah, then I will go and bring in children who are not the children of Abraham and I will make them children of Abraham, and what I have offered to the children of Abraham, I will offer to the whole world. And that's exactly what happened. We, who were not the sons of Abraham, have been grafted in, and now Abraham becomes our father as well. And the commonwealth, the heritage, is given to us, so that by faith, Abraham is even our father too. But we should not fall into the same kind of pride and the same kind of arrogance of those who did not recognize the value of the master's invitation. Because what happened to the people of old can happen to us as well. We have to understand that our salvation that is offered to us is offered to us by God and we can make no claim to it. We can say that we are the sons of God by baptism because we are. But the very act of our salvation was purposed and is accomplished by Christ alone. None of us are orthodox by birthright. None of us are orthodox by our knowledge. None of us are orthodox by the position we might hold in the church, whatever it may be. All of us are orthodox by our baptism, by our adoption into Christ. And we, what our obligation is, is when the master calls to obey, to serve this Jesus Christ who has called us so in the end we might be chosen as well. Salvation comes from God. We appropriate it in our lives through our obedience. But if we're disobedience, we're sons in name only and not in fact. So the warning that was given, given 
back 2,000 years ago when the parable was first taught applies to us just as much today. To say that we're a son of God requires obedience. To say that we're the son of God requires us to hear the word of God and to keep it. There's no other way. There's no other way. Okay, Father, I got a question for you. How do we do that? That sounds so good, but how do we do that? Well, it tells us the answer to that in the epistle reading today. But before I get to that, before I get to that, let me talk a little bit about our parish of St. Peter's. Because our parish of St. Peter's is a highways and byways parish. That's why we were established. All right? Everybody's eyes over here. <laughs> Although we love the kids, we really do. <laughs> they melt my heart, too. <laughs> It's okay. It's all right. Yes. <laughs> and, and, but back to the, back to the topic. St. Peter's is a highways and byways parish. It has been from the beginning, and it will be, Athanasius, how are you? And it will be into its future if we remain faithful. Now, what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that this parish has been established for those who might not have any familiarity at all with the Orthodox faith, but the Lord might draw them in. And that's happening, and it's going to happen. Right, Robert? Yes. Yes. And it will happen if we remain faithful to God. And if we understand that the reason we're here is so that those who are seeking Christ in the full dimension that is offered in our Orthodox faith, and it's full, and it's rich, and it's true, it's something you can really put your hands around and embrace. People who are looking for that depth of encounter with the risen Christ can find him here but only if we understand what our vision is and what, what responsibilities that vision implies. So, in order for that to happen, and this is really what our commission is, remember, we're, not, we're here to serve God. If we serve God, the church will grow. We're not here to see the church grow. We're here to find God. That's why we're here. But if we seek God, and we find him, the church will grow. Nevertheless, we have, we have a missionary vision, and it comes to us from God, and that is to embrace those that the Lord himself is preparing to bring to us. And when they come, to welcome them and teach them. Teach them, how are you, Eddie? Teach them about our Orthodox faith. In order for that to happen, though, we ourselves have to be faithful. We ourselves have to be obedient. So we go back to the question, well, Father, what do you mean? How is this accomplished? And I always say, well, let's go to back to St. Paul and see what he says. Brethren, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Here are the instructions. Remember I said at the outset that the gospel, the teaching, they, they appeal to the moral center of us. They show us what's true. Here is the practical. Put to death, therefore, that is earthly in you. Put to death fornication. means all sorts of sexual licentiousness. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness which is idolatry. 
on account of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In these you once walked. See, Paul is talking to his church in a Colossae, a city called Colossae. And, and these were people that were pulled out from the pagan world around them. These, these were people that were pulled in by hearing the gospel from the highways and byways. They had not heard of Christ at all. They had not heard of him. But they responded to the gospel, and in responding to the gospel, they put away their old life, and they put on the new. So he says, in these, he's talking to the people, but he's also talking to us, in these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put all of that away, and also put these things away. This is important. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk out of your mouth. Paul talking to the people in his church, you want to become more Christian? He says, then you must do this. If he hadn't have written it in the Bible, then it means that there would have not, have not have been a problem. But there was a problem, so he wrote about it, and that's why it's in the Bible. And if it applies to them, it applies to us as well. No anger, no wrath, no malice, no slander, no foul talk, foul talk out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature. We're new people by virtue of our baptism. We are made new. We have to live in that newness. And living in that newness means putting off the old way, the stuff that I just listed. We have to do that, or else we will not draw closer to Christ. If we don't draw closer to Christ, we will not experience the salvation that he offers on an individual level. And as a church, we will not be prepared for those people that the Lord wants to bring to us. Now, put off the, new, the old nature, put on the new, which is renewed in the knowledge of after the image of its creator. Now remember how I said that if we understand what the parable says, we really understand the inner meaning because it, it, it speaks to the moral center of our being? Once we comprehend that, that's new knowledge. It's new knowledge. And that comprehension itself has power to transform us. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, Paul says in Romans 12, 2. Be renewed by the transformation of your mind. And mind there in the English is noose in the Greek, and the noose is that moral center in us <coughs> by which and through which we see the important things. So it's important to listen, it's important to hear, it's important to apply, because in this listening and in this application, the actual change takes place. And we walk in the new nature and we experience in very concrete terms what this new life in Christ is. We've been called out of the darkness. 20 years ago, it wasn't that easy. 25 years ago to comprehend what that meant. Now it is. It's becoming easier because the darkness is increasing. You look into the culture and, and, and it's, it's slipping into a chaos. That chaos exists because of blindness. That blindness is actually a darkness. It's that darkness that the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrates and it will penetrate to those it will penetrate to those who are seeking light but those people have, who are seeking light need a place to go and St. Peter's will become one of the places that they find that's why the Lord established us that's why 
and that's why we're here. But in order, in order for those people to be saved and find a home, we ourselves must be obedient. We ourselves have to conform ourselves to Christ, and we ourselves must be good to one another and work together, work together so that this vision that is given to us by God may be actualized. And in this church, once it's established, and we're talking about the, the church of Jesus Christ, but the truth is everything is local. It is. You know, we can talk about the larger church, but that exists only as a construct. I mean, it exists in real life, but we can only, we can only talk about it as a construct. The truth is, is that we take communion here in Sweet Six. And this is where we hear the gospel. And this is where we come to worship. So everything is always local. It really is. Paul, when he wrote his epistles, he wrote it to specific churches. Now, it benefited the other churches. That's why it was put into Holy Scripture. But for us, this is home. This is home. And these things happen in your home. They don't happen anywhere else. So we build it here, and we keep our focus here, and we keep our vision here. And, if, and in this church, in the church, in St. Peter's, in the big church, it's all the same. There can be neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, he was actually drawing from the divisions that existed back then. But there's also divisions today. You know, there's no Russian, there's no Greek, there's no Republican, there's no Democrat, there's no rich, there's no poor. All right? All those divisions exist, but they exist secondarily because primary is what? Christ is all and in all. So, this is good, isn't it? Let's just really start thinking about what the scripture says. It is so rich and it really penetrates all dimensions of life. It speaks to everything. So, we're the lame, we're the blind, we're the maimed that has been called. We don't like to think of ourselves as that, but we are. But that's okay. That's really okay. Because if we see ourselves as we are, you know what happens? Compassion opens for the other. And it's the other, the other, that our focus is directed towards. The person sitting next to you in church here, but also the other that haven't, hasn't arrived yet, but will come. And if we understand that and comprehend that and will be faithful to that, then God will bless you, God will bless us, God will bless the person that he will bring to us. But it requires obedience. It requires obedience. And it requires keeping the vision before us and then also the requirements that come out of that vision. And that means living a life that is pleasing to God. There's really no other way. Living a life that is pleasing to God so that the love of God might abound. And when the love of God abounds, salvation is experienced and God is glorified. So through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, may the Lord have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Please rise.